President Nye, Vice President Lambert, the honorable members of the Richmond City Council, fellow city employees, and the residents of the great city of Richmond, good afternoon. Now, before I begin, and President Nye already touched on this as well, I'm going to ask for a little grace as I deliver my eighth and final budget speech. As many of you all know, my wife Brandy and I uh, welcome home our first child, a little Sunday Washington Stoney into the world this, just a little bit over uh, less than a month ago. And I have to admit, she has changed my world in many, many ways. And one of those many ways is the lack of sleep. So please excuse this uh, sleep deprived uh, new father this afternoon. And on that note, as I do my best to adjust to parenthood, I could not be more grateful to the incredible team I have by my side working hard every day to serve the great city of Richmond. So firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the incredible work and dedication of our budget team led by Acting Budget Director Megan Brown, who worked tirelessly year round to ensure our financial house is in order. Under the leadership of Sabrina, Sabrina Joy Hogg, Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Finance and Administration, and Lincoln Saunders, our Chief Administrative Officer, this team has produced a structurally balanced and fiscally responsible fiscal year 2025 budget. This is a $2.9 billion spending plan, with $1 billion of it in the general fund. That means our overall general fund Revenues have grown by almost 40% since fiscal year 2017. Madam President, we certainly do not have every dollar we need to fix all of our problems. But there is no doubt we have grown as a city. We have persevered through crises, and we are stronger than we've ever been before. A few months ago, I stood before you and delivered my final State of the City address. I shared all the progress we have made as a city to improve the quality of life for all Richmonders since 2017. Highlights like a 22% reduction in poverty, a 22% reduction in violent crime, an almost 50% increase in funding for Richmond public schools, more than 6,500 new good paying jobs, over 1,200 lane miles of streets paved, and over a 1,200% increase in funding for affordable housing projects. This progress starts with our budgets and putting our money where our values are. And those investments have paid off. Now, we are a city that is ranked the number one place to live in the Commonwealth of Virginia a city defined by its future, not its past, a city full of dreamers and doers. So today, I stand before you to deliver my final budget address and demonstrate to you how we plan to continue that progress and solidify our position as Virginia's premier city. The operating budget and $460.2 million FY25 capital improvement plan allow us to continue to make critical investments in our shared priorities, such as high quality public education and wraparound support services for our children and families, access to affordable housing and support for our unhoused population, investments in our dedicated city employees, including our first responders, maintaining and improving quality streets, facilities, parks, and city services and support services and resources for our neighborhoods. I'm also very proud of our FY25 budget proposal because each one of you, each one of you, members of the city council contribute to what's included in this budget. I appreciate the time each of you took to identify 
areas in, of need of investment, to meet with the CAO and his budget team, and for the time I know you'll spend in the weeks coming to consider this proposal. This has been the most collaborative budget process since we changed the form of government in the early 2000s. And I hope we are setting a new standard for how future councils and administrations can work together on what is probably our most important duty. So I want to say thank you for your contributions and your willingness to work together. So now, let's dive in. First, I want to start by sharing how we plan to strengthen our neighborhoods and critical city services. We know that our neighborhoods are all unique and have different strengths and challenges. Therefore, we want to lean into those strengths and help address those challenges in a more direct and tailored way. That is why this budget includes $500,000 to restructure our human services division into a Department of Neighborhood and Community Services. This department will be under the leadership of DCAO Tracy DeShazer and emphasize three components, beginning with neighborhood engagement, where we will have focused outreach to neighborhoods and civic associations through our newly appointed neighborhood specialists. This division will provide an enhanced link between our community and city services. This will also include a newly appointed small <coughs> business liaison to ensure smoother navigation of city services for small businesses. Next, neighborhood services, where we are creating stronger alignment and collaboration between existing offices, such as the Office of Children and Families, the Office of Immigration and Refugee Engagement, and the Office of Aging. Lastly, homeless services, where we are dedicating $200,000 to a new office of homeless services with a fully dedicated team to support our unhoused population. Overall, this new department creates a more comprehensive and coordinated service delivery model for our community with feedback from our new neighborhood specialists. Each of our neighborhoods are vibrant and dynamic ecosystems made up of residents, families, and businesses. For each to thrive, we must support every facet of them and make it easier for residents and businesses alike to access, to access the services needed from their local government. No one department can accomplish this alone. It takes all of us, and that's exactly what this proposal will accomplish. Furthermore, we are dedicating $1 million towards modernizing our 311 call center. Our, over the next year, we will invest in, in advanced call center technology and infrastructure to improve call routing, response times, and overall customer experience. I know many residents use 311 on a daily basis, likely to report a pothole, which means improving this tool is so very important. Lastly, continuing our efforts to enhance critical city services, we're devoting substantial resources to simplify the process of paying taxes and bills here in the city of Richmond. In fact, for many months, we've already been working hard to refine our current policies and reform our systems to create a more efficient and customer-friendly environment for all. But we won't stop there. I'm pleased to share that my FY25 proposed budget includes $5.6 million in Department of Information and Technology enhancements, enhancements, which includes RVA pay. Now, these enhancements will take time to roll out, but we are putting our money where our, our mouth is and committing the necessary dollars to provide better customer support and services for Richmonders. In addition to investing in our community and enhancing city services, this proposal continues to prioritize our public schools. As I've said time and time again, education is the great equalizer. That is why from 
Day one as your mayor, I have worked with city council and members of our community to ensure our kids have access to the best education opportunities, both in and outside the classroom. So let's start with what happens in the classroom. It has been my philosophy that as the city's revenues grow, we should also equally increase our investment in Richmond Public Schools. In FY25, we are projecting that our recurring revenues will grow approximately 7%. So that is why I am proposing a $15.8 million increase to RPS's operating budget. Our FY25 local contribution to RPS of $237.3 million is $85.7 million more than fiscal year 2017's allocation. This new, this, this now represents a 57% increase in city support of RPS throughout my time as mayor. <laughs> Madam President, educators serve as the navigators of our children's educational journey. Therefore, they deserve nothing less than a competitive salary that reflects their invaluable role. So let me be clear. We want and need more RPS teachers. And with comp a competitive salary, we will attract more teachers who will choose to stay at RPS. This year's investment will help cover the teacher pay raises that were negotiated by Richmond, the Richmond Education Association and RPS during their collective bargaining process. With this significant increase in funding for RPS, I would be remiss if I did not take the opportunity to call on our governor, Governor Yunkin, to maintain the funding for K-12 recently proposed by the bipartisan General Assembly budget. <laughs> Madam President, drawing upon your experience as a former member of the school board, you are undoubtedly aware that the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, as underscored by the JLARC study, fails to adequately fund the true cost of public education. In fact, based on our analysis, state funding has not even kept up with the cost of inflation over the past eight years. Consequently, localities like ours are left to bear the burden of their negligence. This practice must stop in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So once again, I urge the governor to prioritize our children. We also know that in addition to robust academic plans, our kids need safe and healthy environments to learn, which means we need updated 21st century facilities. I'm excited that RPS, the RPS school board, has finally moved forward with a $131 million bid for the new Richmond High School for the Arts. This also means that RPS has approximately $69 million remaining for immediate use for new school construction. And our proposed CIP budget includes the next tranche of $200 million in funding in fiscal years 2029. I am proud that in total, since 2017, my administration has dedicated over $350 million to new school construction. Now, switching gears. I want to focus on what we are doing for our kids outside the classroom. I'm proud of the fact that every middle and elementary school student has access to quality after school programs. But we know we can always provide more opportunities, especially with our growing population. That is why we are maintaining funding levels for critical after-school efforts. That means $1.2 million for the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Community Facilities to continue the activation of Southside, Powhatan, and Randolph Community Centers, and 
to support the expansion of their affordable after-school program to every RPS elementary school. $888,000 to maintain and grow after-school expanded learning programs at every middle school. $767,000 for staffing and operation of our new community centers, including Lux Field, T.B. Smith, and Southside Community Centers. $1 million for our Positive Youth Development Fund to support community-based programs for youth ages 12 to 19 years old. And $414,000 to the We Matter RVA Youth Violence for Prevention Program. Additionally, as many of you know, I've not only been committed to supporting our kids from K through 12, but also those ages zero to five. When I was a kid, I did not go to preschool. I did not go to kindergarten. I was enrolled into first grade when I first entered school. And I can remember how tough it was those first couple months. I can recall vividly three different reading groups, the red group, the yellow group and the green group. And at seven years old, I knew me being in the red group meant that my reading was not up to par. Now, I would not have been able to rise from the red group to the green group without help from home. I can vividly remember my grandmother working with me on the refrigerator, spelling out words like pop and top and car and bar. And that helped me rise into the green group. See. Many Richmond kids are not so different from me. Approximately 52% of children beginning kindergarten RPS in the fall of 2022 lacked the skills needed to learn. And over one third of kindergartners had no preschool experience. I not only want more opportunities that, than I had for my daughter, but I also want more for all of Richmond's youngest residents. And trust me, I've heard from countless parents that there is a lack of options for affordable, quality childcare and preschool that meets the needs of Richmond's working families. In fact, in Central Virginia, for families with incomes under 200% of the federal poverty level, there is just one publicly funded early child care and education slot for every eight infants and toddlers. One for every eight infants and toddlers. Can we agree that that's downright shameful? Now, despite the casino proposal not moving forward, which would have provided a transformative revenue source for childcare needs, my team has worked diligently to find other ways we can support this critical need. So, working with Thrive Birth to Five, we are establish, establishing Richmond's first child care and education trust fund with an initial investment of $1 million from the city with $500,000 in reallocated American Rescue Plan funds and a recurring investment of $500,000 in the FY 2025 budget. And as a reminder, Thrive Birth to Five is an independent entity that has already been designated by the Virginia Department of Education to administer a unified public-private early child care and education system right here in Richmond. Partnering with Thrive Birth to Five, we're going to use these funds to ensure that as many children as possible have access to quality, affordable child care and preschool programs so that they can begin kindergarten ready to succeed in school and in this life. These investments are about activating our communities and creating strong foundations for our children and families to thrive. And yes, it's pretty simple. As long as I'm your mayor, we will continue to put our kids first. <laughs> Madam President, members of council, we have accomplished quite a lot over the last eight years. And this FY25 budget will continue that great work. One accomplishment I am particularly proud of is that we have reduced the poverty rate by 22% since 2017. This has been a shared goal of mine and 
past administrations, and Councilwoman Robertson has been at the forefront of these intentional poverty mitigation investments. In 2014, the city of Richmond created the Office of Community Wealth Building, which is committed to developing pathways for economic mobility. In 2020, we established the Richmond Resilience Initiative, our guaranteed income pilot to help working but struggling residents pay for groceries, childcare, and more. In 2020, we established a Family Crisis Fund, which has helped 936 Richmond families stay afloat during challenging times using $3.3 million in dedicated funds. And last year, we created the Pathways Program, which will help RPS graduates to and through community college. Many of these programs were piloted with one-time funding during the pandemic, but now is the time to establish these services as part of our annual commitment to lifting individuals and families out of poverty and giving them a fair shot. That is why I'm proposing another $250,000 for the Pathways Program, $500,000 for the Richmond Resilience Initiative, and $1 million for the Family Crisis Fund and FY25 to ensure we continue this vital work. These investments will not give, not only give hardworking residents room to breathe, but also an opportunity for them to dream again. Another initiative that is key to reducing intergenerational poverty and increasing economic mobility is access to affordable housing. Regrettably, Richmond, along with other cities across the country, is grappling with a housing crisis. We are seeing higher rents, more eviction notices, and fewer home ownership opportunities, especially for our low income residents. That's why in last year's budget, our capital improvement plan included $50 million for affordable housing projects over five years. Additionally, after seeing our efforts, LISC committed to matching our investment with $50 million of their own. That means we have a total of $100 million over five years to address the housing crisis. This is the most funding ever, the most funding ever dedicated to affordable housing in Richmond's history. And I'm proud to report that we have already put that funding to good use. Recently, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund approved all of our recommended awards from our most recent NOFA for affordable housing projects. And thanks to this funding, we are supporting the creation and preservation of over 1,000 affordable units in the coming months. This is not the only investment we are making in affordable housing, though. We're also investing another $5 million for the redevelopment of Creighton Court. This project is managed by the Richmond Redevelopment Housing Authority and HUD and will result in a mixed income, vibrant community of choice for our residents. And when I ran for mayor, I committed to supporting RRHA with their redevelopment efforts because our residents deserve better housing conditions. And since 2017, we've invested over $25 million into RRHA projects through a combination of local and federal dollars. Now, we, are st we still have a long way to go, but this FY25 budget continues those critical investments for our families. And in addition to creating more affordable housing opportunities, we, are also, we also need to ensure that families can stay in their current homes. That is why we are also increasing the allocation to the city's first of its kind eviction diversion program. Since its inception in late 2019, this program has helped more than 1,600 families avoid and escape eviction. But we can always do more to support our families facing eviction. In 2022, I visited the John Marshall Courthouse with Marty Wegbrecht. I joined Marty to observe the eviction hearing process. I listened to residents who had to take time 
off of work and defend themselves without help. They had just about no chance against the landlord who often had legal representation. That is why in this budget, we are increasing EDP funding for $1 million, to $1 million, I'm sorry, and including $500,000 for the creation of a right to counsel pilot program to enhance our diversion efforts and keep folks in their homes. I'm also proud of the work we have done to serve our unhoused residents. Last year, we added a total of 200 shelter beds, and we are in the process of establishing our first housing resource center. To further support these efforts, we are proposing a total of $4.2 million in FY25 to support our shelters and services for those who are unhoused. Furthermore, I am proud to share and acknowledge that we are not alone in this work. Our partners in Henrico County have recently committed to cover a quarter of the total cost of operating these new emergency shelters. So Madam President, let us take a moment to thank Chairman Nelson and County Manager Vatokis and the entire Henrico County Board for stepping up as a partner with the city to meet the growing need we see across our communities. Let me be clear. It has been the goal of this administration to create abundant opportunities for our residents to keep a roof over their heads and food on their tables. And that's for every resident in every corner of this great city. The investments outlined today are critical to achieving this objective. Here in Richmond, we believe that government has a role to play in addressing the challenges of a world experiencing a changing climate. Our stated goal is to be the greenest city on the East Coast. This is why we have been intentional with our work by launching the RVA, 20, RVA Green 2050 plan, purchasing 50% of the city's electricity from off-site renewable energy sources, starting a CPACE program, greening our fleet, and investing over $850,000 in our Neighborhood Climate Resilience Grant Program. Because of our strategic efforts, Richmond was named the number one climate resilient city in the country by USA Today. However, we cannot rest on our laurels. That is why I'm excited to share that my FY 2025 budget continues this work by investing an additional $250,000 into neighborhood climate resilience grant programs. Furthermore, I am proposing that we reallocate $680,000 of the American Rescue Plan funds to create Richmond's first solar fund with the intent of adding solar to both T.B. Smith Community Center and RPD's new first precinct facility in the East End. We're also committed to improving every corner of our great city through our strategic capital investments that reflect our ongoing commitment to community needs and priorities in a growing city. Since taking office, we have spent more than $91 million enhancing our street infrastructure to improve the quality and safety of our roads. This year, your, our proposed budget includes an additional $21 million for our Complete Streets program, which includes critical improvements in paving, bridge maintenance, new bike lanes, and sidewalk maintenance. If approved, we will have allocated $112 million in road infrastructure since 2017. And we will be well on our way to accomplishing my goal of having 80% of our streets in good condition by the end of this year. Overall, 
These investments will enhance the connectivity of our great city and promote the safety of all of our residents. So whether you walk, whether you bike, drive, or use public transportation, our commitment is to make sure that you can do it safely and smoothly. Additionally, to ensure the better delivery of services and a stronger alignment of services, I am proposing a half a million dollars in my FY25 budget for the creation of a Department of General Services. This department will reside in the Operations Division, led by DCAO Bob Steidel, and help us diversify the responsibilities previously all managed by the Department of Public Works. Specifically, this department will manage special capital projects and real estate services, fleet and parking for the city. Additionally, we have allocated $10 million to continue to replace our aging city fleet and $14 million towards deferred capital maintenance needs. Now, I know this may seem like a lot, but due to economic downturns and disinvestments dating back to the early 2000s, Richmond has more than $293 million in deferred capital maintenance. My fellow Richmonders, we must address this need, which is why we are prioritizing it in the budget, both with funding and greater strategic support provided by the Department of General Services. Members of council, as you know, we live in a city that's rich with natural resources, namely our robust park system. We know that access to green spaces and community centers is important for residents of all ages across every neighborhood, from the three new community centers under construction this year, to the acquisition of Mayo Island, the property off of Dock Street, and the improvements underway at Hotchkiss, Wickham Court, Bryan Park, Fonticello Park, and several others. I'm incredibly proud of the fact that over the past few years, we have made game-changing investments that will enhance our park systems for generations and generations to come. But we're not stopping there. I am proposing an additional $1.5 million for park improvement projects in this budget. On top of the more than $2 million in incremental funding we are proposing to spend from this fiscal year an ARPA reallocation. This funding will not only allow for the continued activation of the new parks in Southside, but also improvements at existing parks and community centers, such as Humphrey Calder, Forest Hill, Battery Park, Little John Park, and Holly Street Park. We're also including $200,000 to hire three additional park rangers who will ensure our parks stay safe and welcoming for all. And I would be remiss if I did not thank Councilwoman, Council President Nye for her leadership and the idea of establishing the Park Ranger Program. Thank you, Council President. I'm also proud to announce that we are making an initial investment of $10 million in FY25 to collaborate with Venture Richmond to make improvements to Browns Island. Venture has committed to raising at least $10 million in private funding to match the city's contribution to this beloved gathering space along the James River. This investment will not only further activate our riverfront, but also it will provide critical enhancements to the island, including play spaces for children, more trees and landscaping, and greater ADA accessibility among other amenities and improvements. Yes, we are bringing the Riverfront Master Plan to life. From the Riverfront Amphitheater to the James River Center off of Dock Street, we're bringing that master plan finally to life. I'm also proud of all we have done to enhance our park system and improve access to green space through our Parks and Recreation Department. In fact, since FY 2017, 
We've increased our total funding for parks and recreation and, and park recreation and community facilities by 62%. And I want to say I appreciate this city council's dedication to supporting these critical community enhancements. In my last State of the City speech, I announced that it was time for the former Washington football team facility on Lee Street to transition from being a training camp facility, which only hosted a professional football team for 13 days a year, to a community facility 365 days of the year under the management of the Departments of Parks and Recreation. The fields the city built over a decade ago for the Washington team will now host youth football, youth soccer, and countless other events, festivals, and sports for all Richmonders. And building on the opportunity we have on Lee Street, I also believe it's high time our Parks and Recreation Department had a permanent home, one that reflects the critical role the department plays in our community. After years of renting their facility on Admiral Street, I am proposing that Parks and Rec will make Lee Street their new headquarters. As Bon Secours moves their medical offices to a new site at the Sauer Center, Parks and Rec can adapt the space for their administrative needs, while also maintaining the gym and lockers for athletic programs and the second floor event space for community meetings, event rentals, and other uses. This is yet another significant investment that will benefit our community for years and years to come. As I've stated before, none of the great advancements we have made as a city will be possible without our dedicated city employees, which is why this budget proposal increases the wages of our hourly paid employees so that no one directly employed by the city of Richmond will make less than $20 an hour. With a $20 an hour minimum wage, the city of Richmond will offer one of the highest minimum wages among localities in the Commonwealth of Virginia, which is $8 more than the Commonwealth pays for their minimum, and more than double the federal minimum wage. If the city council approves this increase, we will have gone from $11.66 per hour in 2017 to $20 an hour, a 72% increase since I became mayor. And that's not all. In 2020, I was publicly the first local elected official to advocate for the Commonwealth of Virginia to give municipalities the authority to move forward with collective bargaining. And as you likely know, workers in the South were barred from bargaining collectively for the same reason that enslaved people were barred from learning how to read, because the powerful know there is power in numbers. We were eventually given the necessary authority and became the southernmost locality in Virginia to commit to a collective bargaining agreement for our city employees, an accomplishment I'm very proud of. So working collaboratively with city council and our employees, we established five bargaining units, police represented by ARCOP, fire and emergency, serv fire and emergency services represented by IAFF 995, administration and technical represented by SEIU, professional re represented by SEIU, and labor and trades represented by the Teamsters. We have successfully reached agreements with police, fire and emergency services, and the administration and technical units. We will start negotiations with the professional and labor and trades units shortly after the fund we finalize the FY25 budget. So in fiscal year 25, we are allocating 
$9.1 million to raise pay for our police officers, firefighters, and emergency services employees, $3 million for our administrative and technical employees, and for all other city employees, we are allocating $3 million to provide a 4% salary increase and an additional $2 million to make targeted pay increases for positions making below the market rate identified through the class and compensation study I announced in last year's budget. Our Our philosophy in approaching these negotiations and how we have structured these agreements is very simple. As a city, we have to be competitive. That's why our agreements with police and fire commit us not to only meeting, but exceeding the average pay for sworn personnel in the region. And it's, yeah, that's a round of applause. And it's why our approach for all other employees is to balance general wage increases with market-based adjustments. Together, these strategies have helped us keep the talent we have, attract the talent we need, and move us toward becoming an employer of choice. Madam President, bargaining was not always easy. But I'm proud to have our employees at the table and for them to have a voice in how we operate and how we support them. And we are doing so much more for our employees outside of just these agreements. We've increased parental leave from four to eight weeks. We transitioned to the Virginia retirement system. We created opportunities for professional development. We opened new employee health clinics operated by Marathon Health. And we implemented a down payment assistance program for city employees who are first time home buyers. We are, better, we are better today than we were eight years ago. And I see that each and every day when I come to work with some of the best and brightest public servants in the Commonwealth of Virginia. <laughs> Madam President, in conclusion, over the past almost eight years, we have collectively changed the city's trajectory. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. We have changed this city's trajectory. And through grit, hard work, and intentionality, we came together to change Richmond's story, to change Richmond's future, and to allow Richmonders to simply dream again. You've changed the standard for this city, for what you can expect from City Hall, and what you should expect in your quality of life when you pay your taxes. While we still absolutely have much to achieve, it cannot be denied, Richmond is rising. This proposal before you today outlines a detailed action plan to propel our ascent. And that's what we must do. We must continue to ascend. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, members of the City Council. And may God bless the great city of Richmond.